Nicaragua is a small country in Central America. Its territory runs right across the isthmus, or thin strip of land, joining North America and South America. So on one side it has the Pacific Ocean, and on the other side the Caribbean Sea. For about 40 years, from 1937 until 1979, Nicaragua was controlled by a family dictatorship. That started to break down in 1972 when there was a devastating earthquake in Nicaragua. As many as 10,000 people died, and hundreds of thousands were left homeless. The world responded with considerable foreign aid, much of which was stolen by the dictatorship. There was an outcry, and at the head of the outcry was a socialist group called the Sandinistas. They opposed the dictatorship, but cleverly, they also spent a great deal of time and effort actually helping people who had been affected by the earthquake. They became very popular, and their revolution was ultimately successful, overthrowing the dictatorship in 1979. If they hadn't been a socialist group, one suspects that the world would have quietly celebrated the fall of yet another dictator and the Sandinistas would have ruled unmolested. But this was the height of the Cold War. International communism and socialism had been expanding for years and US policy was to contain any further expansion. The last thing they wanted was another socialist stronghold in Central America. As a result, the United States began to supply arms to several groups who opposed the Sandinistas, principally a group called the Contras. Initially, Congress approved of this spending under the Carter and Reagan administrations, but then Congress withdrew its support. President Reagan famously continued the supply of weapons, primarily through the work of Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. In 1984, Nicaragua went to the International Court of Justice to complain that the United States of America had violated customary international law by supporting and arming the Contras and by other alleged direct actions, including direct military action, overflights by aircraft and the laying of sea mines to interfere with the free navigation of ships into and out of Nicaragua. The United States has never fully accepted the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. And on this occasion, rather than squarely meeting the Nicaraguan allegations, the United States argued that the court did not have jurisdiction. Essentially, the United States argued that any obligations it had to Nicaragua arose from the United Nations Charter and from two other key multilateral treaties called the Charter of the Organization of American States and the Convention on the Rights and Duties of States. The United States then argued that when it had signed up to the court, it had included a reservation that if the court was applying a multilateral treaty, it could only do so if all the affected states were participating. The United States did not participate on this occasion, and they also argued that the nearby country of El Salvador was affected by the claim and had not been involved. So, said the United States, the court had no jurisdiction. The court quite reluctantly agreed with this argument. They accepted that the Nicaraguan claim under the various treaties could not be considered. However, Nicaragua had also claimed under what is called customary international law. Customary international law reflects the fact that not all of the ways in which sovereign nations deal with one another are established under treaties. Many of the norms of behaviour between countries were developed before a comprehensive system of treaties was developed. But even in modern times, sometimes nations just develop practices in terms of how they deal with one another. All of this brings us to the real question for this case. If there is a treaty on a subject, does that treaty extinguish any customary law in that area? Because if the treaty extinguished customary law, well then, in this case, the court would have no basis for a decision. They would have no jurisdiction under the treaties. And if the treaties had extinguished customary law, well then the court would have no jurisdiction under customary law either, because there would be no customary law. There are some pretty good arguments each way on the question of whether a treaty should extinguish customary law. On the one hand, it's easy to see that if two countries have been dealing with one another for a long time on the basis of customary law, but then they decide to implement a treaty, 
Well, it makes sense that the treaty now incorporates all of the bits of customary law that they want to hang on to. So there'd be no need for customary law in that area, and it could be extinguished. On the other hand, there's an old principle, particularly in countries that follow the common law, which says that statutes, or in this case treaties, they don't do away with the underlying customary or common law, they simply amend it or change it. The law lays over the top of the old practice, and so if the law or the treaty was ever repealed, the customary rules would be right there where we left them, able to continue operating. The court had to decide which of these was the case. The court found the second of these arguments more persuasive. They said, The court does not consider that in the areas of law relevant to the present dispute, it can be claimed that all the customary rules which may be invoked have a content exactly identical to that of the rules contained in the treaties which cannot be applied by virtue of the United States Reservation. On a number of points, the areas governed by the two sources of law do not exactly overlap, and the substantive rules in which they are framed are not identical in content. But in addition, even if a treaty norm and a customary norm relevant to the present dispute were to have exactly the same content, This would not be a reason for the court to take the view that the operation of the treaty process must necessarily deprive the customary norm of its separate applicability. Nor can the multilateral treaty reservation be interpreted as meaning that, once applicable to a given dispute, it would exclude the application of any rule of customary international law, the content of which was the same as, or analogous to, that of the treaty law rule which had caused the reservation to become effective. So it seems that the relationship between customary international law and treaty law is not simple. It does seem that sometimes a treaty might be expressed in a way that excludes customary law from applying. But more often, customary law will remain in place, even if there is a treaty, and particularly where the treaty and the customary law operate in the same area of law but don't cover exactly the same issues. What's not entirely clear, at least not from this judgment, is which of the two will prevail if there is an inconsistency between them. Later judgments have shown that, generally speaking, a treaty will prevail over customary law, but only between the parties to the treaty and only on the specific topics covered by the treaty. Interestingly, it also seems to be the case that treaty law can generate new customary law. So if there is a widespread treaty which most nations follow, it might well be that the conduct of nations in accordance with that treaty becomes the new normal, becomes the new customary law of nations. What did all of this mean for the Nicaraguan claim against the United States? Well, it meant that even though the court couldn't hear their claims that the US had breached the treaties, the courts could hear their claims that the US had breached a range of customary rules of international law. These related to arming and supplying the Contra rebels, to actual armed attacks on Nicaraguan territory, to the laying of sea mines and a refusal to identify the locations of those sea mines and other similar warlike activities. The court ordered that reparations, which means financial compensation, should be paid by the United States to Nicaragua. However, because the United States maintained that the court did not have jurisdiction to hear the matter, the United States also maintained that it was not bound to pay any reparations. No such payments have ever been made. The Sandinistas ruled in Nicaragua from 1979 until 1990. Then they led the opposition from 1990 until 2006. They have ruled Nicaragua again since 2006, although many of their critics say that they have abandoned socialist principles and have become the very type of autocratic authority they were formed to oppose. From this case, we learn that customary international law is not extinguished by treaty law, not even when the treaty and the custom cover precisely the same ground. We also learn that ultimately, international law is powerless. Larger, stronger nations can ignore its decisions and get away with it.